Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, just pray that as we look to what it means um, that he must be prepared to lead, that uh, your word would prove itself to be uh, the truth, it would prove itself to be the source of blessing, and it would prove itself to be the power to change into what you call us to be. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so today is class number four, which is called, He Must Be Prepared to Lead. And so there is a crisis uh, in our time, and it is a lack of male leadership. This is the fruit of years of feminism and LGBT+, uh, what those groups have fought for. Uh, most men have been stripped of the manliness needed to be good leaders in our day. And this means that boys growing up today have no clue that they are the next generation of leaders. And even if they do, they don't know how to be those leaders. Uh, dependency of children upon parents and upon other sources have, has made it hard to train leaders in our day. And so in today's times, we need to convince uh, boys and men that they are called to lead before we can set a standard by which to lead. And so male headship is at a crisis point today. All the cultural revolutionaries have made male headship a boogeyman uh, and the source of all of our systemic problems within society. And therefore, because of that, it needs to be taken down and replaced. Uh, but not all men, uh, not men in general, are the boogeyman, but uh, for a lot of men have been emasculated and uh, are then allies. But masculinity in today, even biblical masculinity, is considered toxic masculinity. Masculine men are men who want to exercise headship and leadership and build culture according to God's plan. So the bad forces, the evil forces, want men instead to be docile, uh, lazy, and impotent. They want the men to be controlled. And so this is what they believe uh, men have made women when they exercise headship. So they're trying to force that upon the men. And because men have been in charge and all these bad things have happened uh, and are happening, it's time to now destroy the men destroy the patriarchy. And so as we consider what it means for male leadership and that he must be prepared to lead, we must be committed to raising our sons to be leaders by teaching what it means uh, to be a man and to exercise headship or leadership over all areas of life and in all areas of life. And we must be committed to teaching our daughters that masculine men who are prepared to lead are to be more desired over any other type of man. And so our big idea for today is, a young man who wants to marry my daughter must be prepared to lead. And so what is male headship or male leadership? It is, uh, the definition is responsible male leadership in the home and in the church. Men are to lead at home, at work, and at church. And lead is not only uh, something to do in authority, as if you are the boss or the leader, but it's also something we do by example. So if we are employees, we are the best employees. We lead the charge in, in being the best servants. Uh, and then in that, in that sense, we exercise leadership. And so to lead is to take charge and forge the path that is to be taken by those who follow. And it's absolutely important to remember that leaders, true leaders, are followed. Moses led the people out of Egypt and they followed. And kings, good kings, lead their people into battles and ahead. And it's important that we make this distinction. There are a distinction in two types of leadership. There's leading and then there is driving. And it's really the difference, to bring an example, of how we handle sheep versus how we handle cows. Sheep need to be led by a shepherd. 
but cows have to be driven by cowboys. Sheep and cows do have similar traits where they like being together in herds. Uh, they like, um, they are easily spooked, and they are not very intelligent. But sheep uh, are different in that sheep will follow a shepherd in which they trust, but cows have to be prodded. It's important there's no such thing as a sheep prod. It's called a cattle prod. And so leaders lead, but tyrants drive. Good leaders are followed to their desired destination, but tyrants force people to the place where they want to go. Leaders have followers. Tyrants have subjects. And so as we think about leadership, it is not the ability to lord over anybody else, but it is the ability to inspire and to create followers and a following to the proper destination. And so we have to ask them the question. Now we have a little bit of leadership. Does leadership then need to be male? And when it comes to our church and in marriage, I think the Bible is clear. Yes. And I would say it is an ideal for culture that men take up the leadership positions. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, God talking about his people, he says, My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. And if you read that context, this was one of the signs that uh, wicked people were under judgment. Children and women were in charge. Men who uh, will not lead or take the head in culture if they are not doing so at home. So even if in culture we can have this, the discussion about male leadership in particular, we know that men will not lead if they're not already leading at home and in the church. Men are who God has appointed to lead the church, and the training ground for that leadership is their families, leading in their families. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 and then 4 says, Therefore an overseer must be first the husband of one wife, he is the head over a wife. He is a husband. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And just to understand that he must be a husband, a leader, and he must shepherd and lead children. In the same way that in the church, he must be a husband. He must care for the church. He must lead the church. He must shepherd the church. And the training ground for learning how to do that is within the family. And so it's important that we understand that male leadership is the design that God had implemented. It's a, it's a design that God has implemented for this world to work properly. And, it's, and, and even though that might sound strange to our modern ears, uh, a, a, a historical overview, if we had time for it, would actually prove that men pro uh, properly leading and showing headship has always been a benefit to society, not a detriment. So we have to ask the question then, if this is true, that this is what God has designed, where then do we come up with God's design for headship? for male headship in particular. And headship, uh, the simple answer for headship, although it's throughout the whole Bible, is in the book of Genesis chapter 2. And so as we see that uh, in Genesis chapter 2 uh, is when we see the story of how God related to Adam, told him what to do, and then how God created Eve from Adam. And I'll just read this section here, and then we can work through it. It says, uh, Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground of now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Uh, and while he slept, he took 
uh, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so we, as we think about where male headship is found in this section, there's a few points I'd like to, uh, I, I, would like to I would like to show you. First, that woman was made for the man, verses 18 through 20. Uh, Man was first called to work and to keep the garden. And then God saw, uh, said, it was not good for the man to be alone. So Adam is in charge of working and keeping the garden, spreading it over all the earth. But he couldn't do it alone. And the Lord saw that it was not good. And what's important about having a helper fit for him <coughs> clearly means... That it's more than just mere animal labor. Uh, Adam didn't just need laborers. He didn't just need someone to just do things. He needed a helper that was fit for him to fulfill all of his needs, all the things that he would need to have in order to fulfill what God had called him to do. So God made Adam with all the talents and skills needed to fulfill the mandate given to him to work and keep the garden. And then God made Eve with all the gifts and skills and talents to complement Adam in this mandate. And so woman was made for the man, as we see in Genesis chapter 2. That's male headship. The second thing is woman was made after the man. And... Uh, Vodi in, in his book says the fact that Adam is the progenitor of the entire human race clearly points to his headship in relation to Eve. All people, including Eve, come from Adam. Therefore, he is the head of all the human race, including his wife, Eve. And so man being made first shows his leadership over the woman. And then, that same time, the woman was made from man, verses 21 and 22. It says this idea shows the, equal, the equality of dignity, but the difference of role. So man and woman are made from the same substance out of Adam, but made with a distinction. There was something different between the two of them. Different not just in their appearance and their, and their physical attributes, but also in their skills, giftings, and talents that were to be complementary to one another. And so men and women are equal but different and made to be complements. Woman is required for man to be complete. But that shows headship because she was made from the man. Even though we can see the equality, that there's not to be this superiority or inferiority between the two sexes. There's equality and dignity and everything else. They're both made in the image of God. But the man was the one from whom woman came from. And so then the next thing, uh, point number four on this, would be that the woman, this is, uh, this is uh, chapter 2, verse 22, that then the woman was brought to the man. God made this woman, then gave her to the man. God was the one that brought Eve to Adam and joined them together. And, and as God made Adam and commissioned him to tend to the garden, then he gave the woman to help and take care of Adam and the garden as well. It was God's gift to man, just as the world and creation was God's gift to Adam too, but he had a responsibility to take care of it, to honor God and to spread God's glory through the world. In the last form that we see of Adam's headship over Eve, was that uh, number five, the woman was named by the man. And Adam, up until this point, is giving name, is given the job of naming all the animals, showing that he has dominion over all of the creation and all of the earth. He's giving it names. And so when Adam gives his 
uh, gives, uh, calls her woman because she was made from man. It is Adam taking his headship and leadership seriously, receiving what God has given him and what God has called him to do. He, she shall be called woman. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they therefore become one flesh. All of these things in Genesis chapter 2, I think clearly point to male leadership uh, with, at least within the marriage. And I think you could expand that to the church and to culture and everywhere else. That is God's design for the world. He made man. And then from man he made woman. And those two complement each other, especially with the man as being head. But even as we see something as clear as this in the scriptures, we have to think, what, what, why would someone argue against this? What, what are the arguments against male headship? And while there are probably many, I only want to focus on two today. So the first one is that male headship is ex first explicitly expressed as part of the curse and not part of the creation. And that comes from um, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And so the question is, is that really the beginning of male headship? And if it is, then doesn't Christ end the curse? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 in the New Testament says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither, neither fail, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there's no such thing as male leadership. It doesn't matter anymore. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And... The fall, and so the idea, like we just saw, is that the fall and the curse bring male headship in, and therefore uh, the gospel would take it away as it reverses the curse. But it's just not a good argument. Because if I'm right, and that, and that headship comes in Genesis 2, then that means that it was already established before the curse and the fall happened. Which means that the fall is partially an issue of headship. For the Satan, for Satan the serpent, uh, tempted Eve, when, and she should have been protected by her head, Adam. But then, the, so that's a bad argument there. The other argument would be, aren't there clear pictures of female leaders in the Bible? And the first one you have to ask is, as we're looking at narratives and examples, are these examples meant to be viewed as a good thing, or a bad thing. And the most popular one is always the one in Judges, uh, Deborah. Um, her and, and uh, Barak. And so what happens in Judges chapter 4 is that Barak's supposed to go to war and he's supposed to uh, conquer this invading nation. And he, and he tells uh, Deborah, I won't go without you. Will you go with me? And in Judges chapter 4 verse 9, Deborah says this, uh, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are on, uh, which you are going, will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And it's important to note that Deborah is pointing out here that this is not a glorious thing that I am coming with you. It is a shameful thing. That's from the words of her own mouth. So the idea when we see these pictures of female leaders, is that the ideal? Are we seeing these people or seeing these pictures because that's what we're supposed to have? Or does the context tell us that these are not good things? And I think the most popular female leader, Deborah, I think if you read the story, you realize in context it is, a, it is not a glory that she is a leader. It is actually a failure of the people in the book of Judges. And so... There is shame in then having a woman go with Barak. There's a shame in Sisera being sold into the hand of a, of a woman, being, being killed by a woman, and those are all shameful things. As God said in Isaiah, my people, uh, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. That was a sign of judgment. And so in conclusion, if a young man wants to marry my daughter, 
He must be committed to being a leader in whatever capacity God has put him in, whatever his vocation is. He must be committed to becoming and being a leader. And if not, he is not qualified to marry my daughter. Thank you for your time.